Is EEO a scam? Welcome back to the channel. I'm Colette Elizabeth. I created this channel as a safe space with you in mind. So today we are going to circle back to the Black Women Get Out and Tell series. And in that series, we talk about, or I encourage Black women to plan, prepare, and exit toxic jobs if they can, as soon as they can, so that they can begin their healing process. In my very first video on this channel, I talked about how I left a toxic job. And that video was called, Do Black Women Stay on Jobs That Are Harmful in Pursuit of the American Dream? That was one of my top performing videos. However, my very top performing video was why are Black women leaving their jobs and joining the Great Resignation? Well, those videos and several others have sparked a number of questions. And I wanna say also comments that I have made on other content creators' pages have sparked comments. Some of those comments are related to, why did you leave? I wish you would have stayed. I wish you would have sued them. I wish you would have did this and I wish you would have did that. And I get that, I understand it. So I'm gonna answer part of those questions now. The main thing that I'm going to really deal with in this video is the EEO process and my experience with it. So prior to leaving my very toxic job with a government agency, I did file an EEO complaint. I filed an internal one, and then I also filed one with the feds. So my internal process was, I can't even explain it. I can't even explain it. I filed that complaint, I want to say in July of 2021. Nothing was done. Not one thing. I got a call. The person took some information and I never heard from that person again. What I will say is that the person that I had initially talked to in July requested some information and documentation to substantiate my claim. And I sent her over 103 pieces of documents via email. And I still have that information. I still have the emails. I still have everything that I sent her. Never received a response. I can tell you that in between the time that I filed my initial EEO complaint against the agency that I work for, I had a performance appraisal that was due and completed by my prior supervisor who was supposed to complete that appraisal and he did prior to him going to another agency. What I'll share with you is after I filed my EEO complaint, my appraisal was withheld by the current person who's serving as the deputy director of that particular agency. The reason she gave me for withholding it was that she didn't get an, an opportunity to work with me she had only been with the agency for only three months, so she was not sure what my job was, and so she did not get an opportunity to review and provide any feedback on my appraisal, which is very strange because that appraisal period, one, she was not there. Like she said, she was not employed with this particular agency, so she would not have any input on my performance appraisal, my immediate manager would have had the primary role of evaluating me. That's number one. Number two, it is not uncommon at all as a second level reviewer, not to have intimate knowledge about the performance of the person who's being evaluated. For example, after I went back to my old assignment and resumed my responsibilities, I walked into having to serve as a second level reviewer to about maybe 50 performance appraisals of individuals I didn't know, had never met, but I was asked to provide second level reviews of those evaluations. So I'm saying all that to say I was a manager, I managed managers. So it's not uncommon for the second level reviewer not to be intimately aware of what the person who's being reviewed, what they do on a daily basis. 
that information is left up to the supervisor who immediately provides oversight over that employee to do. And you say, why are you saying all this? I'm saying all this because the person who denied giving me my performance appraisal had no reason to do so. I had been in upper leadership longer than she had been, right? And I had been with the agency probably 20, well, 25 years longer than she had been, 26 at that time. So I was completely aware of the process of evaluating employees of first level and second level. And when I sent her the section of the personnel management handbook, asking her, where is it in here that she needed to be involved in the evaluation process, she did not respond. I believe that my evaluation was withheld because I filed the EEO complaint. And I believe I named her in that complaint. To this day, which I filed that complaint in, keep in mind, keep these dates in mind. I filed my EEO complaint in July of 2021. My evaluation was withheld in September. I filed a second complaint EEO complaint in September, in and around September, stating retaliation, not receiving my appraisal, unjustly being withheld. And to this day, <laughs> I got a call probably like November 5th or something, 2021. And this is right around the time I had given my notice that I would be retiring because I realized that they weren't going to do anything with this process. And the other thing I want to add is that I also put in a complaint with the Human Resources Services Division. I forgot the date that I put that complaint in, but it was in between the, the date of me filing the first EEO complaint. And actually, I take that back. When I filed the first EEO complaint, EEO must have contacted Human Resources Services Division. Human Resources Services Division then reached out to me and, and said, hey, we understand that there are some concerns that you have about bullying, being harassed in the workplace. And I gave them my report. I also provided that individual with maybe another about 50 to 75 documents to substantiate my claims, to which I never received anything back. Now, what I'll share with you, having been in management for many years, I know the game. Human resources will ask for the information because they want to use it against you. They're not trying to help you. And I'm keenly aware of that. I hadn't heard back from them. And I know why I hadn't heard back from them, because the information that I provided them substantiated my claim that I was being harassed. If my documentation had not substantiated my claim of being harassed, they would have figured out a way to put me on some type of performance restriction or some type of write-up. That's what, that's what they do. That's the, those are the games that they play. And I know those games, okay? I've, I'm completely aware of those games. So I never heard back from them. When I gave my notice to our retirement system that I would be retiring, probably like the beginning of November, all of a sudden, I receive a call from an EEO individual, and this is internal with the agencies that I work for. I receive a call from one of their EEO specialists, and he indicated that he wanted to investigate my claim of, of EEO filings, asked him, which claim are you calling about? So he wanted to, he said he was calling about both of them. He wanted to do the intake process. And I had explained to him, I did the intake process for the first one back when I first talked to his peer who had the same title that he had. And I said it was July, it was probably more like June. And then the complaint, the conversation with the human resources division, that was in July. And my second retaliation EEO complaint was filed in September. This is all of 2021. So I get this call in November and this individual tells me that he needs to take the information and he needs to do an intake. So I asked him, what did the other person do for my first complaint? What was the status of that? He said he could not answer. I asked him, where was the documentation that I sent over a hundred pieces of documents to substantiate my claim? He could not answer that either. He couldn't answer anything. So long story short, I retired. We scheduled some time for me to meet in November to discuss 
supposedly my first claim, I said July earlier was June 30th is when I had that, filed that first claim. And September was the second one. And that was due to retaliation. I felt they were withheld holding my evaluation because I filed this claim. This person who withheld my evaluation has since been promoted and she is the deputy director of that department. So what I'll say to you is this, and you may say, Colette, you sound kind of bitter, you sound kind of pissed. Well, I'm answering the question because I've had people ask me a number of times, why didn't you stay? Why didn't you fight? I want you to understand the process of what I was dealing with. I am in management, managing managers, dealing with different things, very hostile working environment, and I'm being discriminated against. And what's funny is while I was being discriminated against, I, as an agent of this organization, get a referral from that same EEO office to look into a complaint for EEO. And of course, as a manager, I'm professional. I'm going to do my job. Did I feel some kind of way about it? I absolutely did. Why? Because I had not heard about my own complaint. So I retire, I leave, and I get the call from the person from the EEO. EEO. We do a a, an investigate, a so-called intake investigation. So keep in mind, he's asking me the same questions that the first lady asked me about the first claim in June, okay? And then he's asking me about the, my claim in September. Supposedly, he's going to make a decision and he's going to get back to me. I get a letter in the mail saying, hey, we're going to have a decision by this date. Instead of them having a decision, he schedules another appointment with me in December, January, I can't remember. I'm gone. I'm retired. So I submit to this additional interview. Now, keep in mind, he's doing this from home. There's people in the background. I can see them. His grandmother is somebody. She's walking around. We're talking privately and he's taking this intake information. I give it to him, but I do let him know. I do feel uncomfortable because I feel like this is not confidential. So we proceed. I give him the information. He says he's going to give me a decision. A couple weeks later, I get a letter in the mail saying, hey, we need to meet with you again about your EEO complaint that you filed on November 5th, 2021. And I'm looking at this going, oh, they just have the date wrong. I need to let them know. So I submit to the appointment. I tell him, listen, you have on here November 5th, 2021, or whatever date they had, that's incorrect. That's not when I filed my EEO complaint. I filed the first one June 30th, 2021. I filed the second one in September of 2021. And then I had a conversation with Human Resources Services Division on this date. I had all my dates together and all my paperwork. I still have it here somewhere. He says, oh, well, you know, this is the day that we talked. I said, but that's not the date that I filed my complaint. Now, let me explain something to you. The first complaint, I have an email confirmation that that was received and filed in June of 2021. The second complaint was sent to his boss directly, emailed to her, or I'm telling her that I am filing this complaint because I feel like I'm being retaliated against because I filed the first complaint and I'm being retaliated against by them withholding my performance evaluation. So you might say, well, why is that a big deal? That's a big deal because I was returning to an office that I had fled from, where I had already been harassed, but I was stuck. Rather than dealing with this manager, I was put on a special project. Now, I want to share this with you. Prior to transferring, I had put in numerous complaints to this person who was harassing me's direct manager, who was an administrator. I put a complaint into the administrator's boss. She was a deputy chief. And I put a complaint into her boss, who was the deputy director, who has since retired. I did this a number of times. Nothing was done until I went to our legislators. As a citizen of this state, I went to my legislator and I explained to them what was happening to me. And it, it, the funny thing about it is I had to go to them the year prior for the same thing in the same office. So fast forward, I go on this two-year assignment. 
now I'm returning to this hostile working environment, this, this boss who is harassing me, okay? She has since retired. She hadn't retired when I came back though, but she, at the time when I came back, she was still there. So me knowing this, I'm stuck, right? Now I can't really go to another agency because guess who they're gonna call for a reference? They're gonna call her. So this performance appraisal was very important because it would show even if she gave me a bad reference, which she would, I would have something in my official personnel file showing, hey, this is her work. This is what she does, right? But that was being denied, keeping me stuck in this trap to where I could not move. So that's why that was important. So fast forward, I had mentioned that the EEO officer from the agency that I worked for had called me and we had an interview, right? I get another letter in the mail referencing my complaint for November, 2021. So the last time I met with him in April, we had maybe two and a half hour interview. And during this interview, he recorded it and I recorded it. Now it's a two-party state. That means that both parties have to agree to be recorded. So I have the whole conversation recorded. He agreed to it and said that he would agree to it if I stipulated that his recording was the official recording. I stipulated so and asked for a copy of that recording. We are at, we're in 2023. I have not seen the recording and nor have I gotten a decision. During our conversation, I explained to this person, you all keep putting November 2021 as my date that I submitted my EEO complaint. And why is it taking so long for you all to make a decision? Oh, we had to send it to the legal department. And the legal department made a decision that you have a valid claim. And they made that decision on November, whatever that date was, 2021. So that's the date we put in there. So I explained to him, wait a minute, you can't just change my date. You can reference that as the date that the legal department determined that I had a valid claim, but you can't make that the date that I filed my initial claim. My initial claim was filed in June of 2021. And the second claim was filed in September of 2021, not November. Oh, well, we did that because legal determined that it was valid then that it, uh, justifiable reason to, to file the complaint. This is what the EEO office for the agency said to me, right? I have this stuff recorded. They said I would receive a decision on or before April 20th of 2022. I've never received the decision, never received a call back. I followed up with him. He had asked for additional documents, some of which I had already sent. I sent them to him again. I still have my emails showing that I sent the stuff, showing what I sent, who I sent it to. I have my emails where I sent for the first complaint in June of 2021, every single one of them. I have my emails that I sent to HRSD. That was in July, 2021 about the harassment because I guess they separated that. And then I have my complaints that I sent in September. I have all of them, even though I retired, I have them all, every single email and every single attachment. What I will share with you is to this day, I have never heard from the EEO office from this agency that I work for, nor have I heard from anyone else from that agency. So then I filed a complaint with the federal EEO, okay, which is EEOC, the man who is a non-Black minority, and there have been problems with EEOC, known problems with EEOC denying complaints from Black people. That's a known problem. And he said that they're not going to do anything. He told me point blank on the phone, we're not going to do anything. And we're going to make it so that the Department of Fair Employment and Housing doesn't do anything either. We're going to make a decision for both of them. And sent me a letter saying that. So when people ask me, Colette, why didn't you stay and fight? I did fight. And keep in mind, that was the second complaint I filed. The first complaint I filed was two years prior with EEOC. 
I gave them, I have the binder here, a ream of paper. Same group of people. Anti-blackness is real. Absolutely real. Okay. And people say people of color. I do not subscribe to people of color because generally people within that group of people of color have an anti-black sentiment. And I experienced that. Many of us experienced that. I've talked to people who worked in those offices who are black people who are telling me the same thing. They're seeing it all over the nation where black people's cases are getting denied. So my case, the man told me straight up that they were going to deny it. They weren't going to look at it. They weren't going to investigate it. They weren't going to do any of that and did not give me a reason why. So what do you do? What do you do? Now, some people say, Colette, you could have sued. When I got my right to sue letter, I could have sued. By then I was exhausted, completely exhausted. You figure I've been dealing with this for years, years and years and years in plain sight. Now, what's funny is I have asked some of the witnesses, did they ever call you? Never talked to none of my witnesses. And I'm talking about the internal EEO with the agency that I worked for. Didn't talk to any of my witnesses, not one. No intent. No intent to investigate. No intention of doing that. None. So when people ask me the question, what do I think of EEO? EEO is a scam. What I found out is that I do not have the complexion for the protection. There are some people who do. I'm not one of those people. I have seen cases where, I mean, I've seen all kinds of cases because as a person who is in management, I often have to respond to allegations, EEO claims and things like that with this same office that I was filing with. And am I disappointed? I'm very disappointed because the person who runs that EEO office, at least the person who was there when I left, she's black. She's black and her boss is black. So when people say, you know, oh, it can't be this, that person is black. Let me explain something to you. Racism is real. Anti-blackness is real. It's real in life. It's real in the workplace. And I'm going to share something else with you that you probably already know if you've been in this situation. It could not survive or thrive without racist tools that look like you and me. Meaning that white supremacy and racism in these jobs and harassment could survive without having a black tool or a non-white minority tool, they couldn't survive. They couldn't survive without those tools. And when I say tools, I mean people, okay? You have people who will willingly sit by the door. We used to call it, there used to be a name for that. And it was called the blip by the door. So you have these situations where they'll hire one person, right? A lot of these DEI programs, they'll hire a black person. That Black person, they're not representing Black people. It's a job, their job. Now, what I will share is I know that a lot of the Black people who are trying to do their job in DEI, they're receiving hell too. They're getting harassed too in the diversity, equity, inclusion programs. They are getting harassed. I talk to them. I've been on panels with them. They are getting harassed as well. So you say, Colette, so what does all this have to do with women get out and tell? What it has to do with is I advocate for Black women who are being harmed in the workplace to follow all of the channels that you can to get your your claims of mistreatment, whether it's a mistreatment due to discrimination or being a part of a protected class or whether it's harassment, getting that stuff documented, even if it doesn't happen for you, which it did not happen for me, it's in place for other people, okay? And I know that doesn't help you, but sometimes it's not about you. 
It just isn't. A lot of the struggles that we went through and we still go through as Black people, a lot of those bricks that were built for us to be in situations that we are in where we're able to receive some of the benefits and some of the freedoms that we have, those prices were paid by other people that came before us. And sometimes you are that person paying the price for somebody else. And I know that is the situation with me at this point. I am personally aware of a number of Black women at that same agency who have been harassed, who have filed EEO complaints, who have filed different things with their supervisors, with their managers, and then they were retaliated against. And I'm talking about people in management. Okay. I'm not talking about regular staff. Now, regular staff, I've seen it too, but I am talking about Black women in management. Now, let me tell you the game that they play. What they do is when they get all these complaints against them, they will promote one Black person who is out for themselves. And I'm not putting people down. You should accept a promotion that you have worked for. Okay. But what I'm saying is they do that so they can say, we do have a black person. So for example, in the, in the agency that I worked for in the particular branch that I was working in, there were no black administrators for years, even in the position that I was in mid management. I'm the only black person who had been promoted in that position since the eighties, 1980s. One person had to leave the region and come back into a higher position to operate in the position that I was in. Another person who was in the position Black, she actually brought her position with her. She transferred with the position. She wasn't promoted to that level. I was the first Black person promoted to that level since 1980s. And there has not been another one promoted to that level in this region since everybody else, but not another black person. Okay. So I just wanted to share that with you. I did try to fight. I know some people wanted to know why didn't you fight? I did try to fight, but sometimes you have to leave. People decide, they decide, they have their decisions made. Like I said, the person who denied my evaluation, she's gotten promoted. When she came to the organization, job description was very clear. It asked for specific program experience for a specific program. She did not have that experience. They still hired her. And then what they did is when another position similar came up, when somebody else was interviewing for that position, they moved her, the, the woman that got the position that did not have the experience. They moved her into this new position and put the other person into her old position that she had for like a month without advertising it. So they do what they want, okay? They do what they want. And she was supported and she still will be supported. Even though anybody with program experience, she has run out. Now, I'm not saying that's why she didn't give me my evaluation. I have my own assumptions as to why she did that. But she's run out almost every Black person that was in any position of authority out of there. It's almost like, the branch that I left is being regentrified. It's my observation. It's being regentrified. They bring up one person because they want to say, oh, we're not, we not racist. We have a black so-and-so. So that's what happened with EO. That's my experience with EO. It is a scam internally, and it's a scam through EEOC. That's my experience. You are Black. You are not the type of minority that they are going to be looking into. In other words, you do not have the complexion for the protection. I repeat, you do not have the complexion for the protection. Now, some of you may have had different experiences. And if you have, I'm happy for you because I hate to think of other people experiencing what I experienced. Me and somebody were talking, a lot of these programs that were set up by African-Americans are now run by other minority groups. And these groups, they have a certain agenda. And it is what it is. The numbers are what they are. I read somewhere, I was told, is that Black managers working at EEOC 
are having a problem with a certain uh, minority group. And I am not surprised because that same minority group, the man told me clear as day, hey, we're not going to do anything. I said, do you want me to send you any of my documentation? He said, no. He didn't want it. He didn't need it. He's making a decision and he will be sending out the denial that day. But hey, I'm still here. I'm still healing. I just talked to somebody probably a few days ago who left. Same reason, same way I left. Retired in lieu of resignation. If you want me to cover anything else, I know some people had asked me to cover exactly what I'm doing after I left my toxic job. I'll share that. And also my video that's gotten the most views thus far, why are black women leaving their jobs and joining the great resignation? I think some people have asked me, do I regret leaving? And what I'll tell you is hell no, I don't regret leaving. Maybe you had a different experience with EEO. Or maybe you think I should have did something differently. Probably, but I did everything I knew to do. I went up the chain of command. I went to legislators. I went to outside, inside, side to side. I did it all, okay? It just did not work out for me. But I still encourage you to document everything, to file those complaints and follow the chain of command, follow whatever processes they have in place so that if you do go to court, you have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed, okay? So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to get more content like this, please subscribe to the channel. And I do have a playlist called Black Women Get Out and Tell. Until the next video, we'll talk.